Good day and welcome to another physics lesson. Please remember to subscribe, to like and share. That way you will be able to uh, receive notifications when new videos drop. Also, see the different videos already on the channel for your different lessons. There, is, there are quite a wide range of videos on different topics there. See them so that you can learn or review whichever topic in physics you need to review. Also, use the comments section, the comments and button of this channel to get back to me on topics uh, that you would like me to take or the videos that you would like me to do. So today we are looking at conduction through gases. There is already a video on conduction through liquids. So both gases and liquids are fluids. So there is a broader topic called conduction through fluids. That's liquids and gases. So I have split them up. I've looked at conduction through liquids. See the video on the channel also. And then here we have conduction through gases. Today we will be explaining the conditions under which gases conduct electricity. We'll explain the behavior of charges in, ga in gases. And then we'll describe applications of electrical conduction in gases. So let's get started. Conduction through gases, the discharge tube. The instrument that is used in studying conduction through gases is the discharge tube. If you have looked at the video on conduction through liquids, you will remember that the instrument that is used to study conduction through liquids is what we call the voltameter. Now, for conduction through gases, we use the discharge tube. The discharge tube consists of long glass tube with metal electrodes sealed to each end. We have a vacuum pump connected to the side of the tube to alter the pressure of the gas in the tube. Now, this is very important. For gas to conduct electricity, it must have a low pressure and a high potential difference. A low pressure and a high potential difference. Do not forget that. At low pressure and at high PD, gas in a discharge tube splits into ions. That was what we called um, electrolytic dissociation for conduction through liquids. So here, you can see that when the condition is right, gas can also split into ions. Now, positive ions, as usual, because they are positively charged, they migrate to the negatively charged electrode, which is the cathode. So, positive ions move to the cathode, while negative ions move to the anode. Now, the positive ions that have moved to the cathode knock off electrons from the cathode. They knock electrons off. Now, those electrons are what we call cathode rays. So, when electrons are knocked off, from the uh, cathode by positive ions, we, they produce what is called a cathode ray. You can see that in the diagram right uh, on, the, on, the, on the right hand side of the screen. On the diagram, you can see that the cathode rays are being deflected towards the positive terminal of the electric field. So on that diagram, you have a, cath a discharge tube that has been placed in an electric field. You can see the electric field, positive and negative. Those are the uh, brick red rectangles, positive below, negative on top. Now, because the electrons that have been knocked off are negatively charged, negatively charged materials are usually attracted towards a positive pole or a positive terminal. So that's why you see the cathode rays moving towards a positive terminal of dielectric field. So this tells us then that if placed in an electric field, cathode rays will be deflected towards the positive terminal of that field. On the other hand, if placed in a magnetic field, since cathode rays, like I said earlier, are negatively charged, 
and they flow in a particular direction, that's the direction of current, they generate a magnetic field. Now, another magnetic field will then cause a deflection of the beam, according to Fleming's left-hand rule. There's also a video on this channel that has talked, that has talked about Fleming's left-hand rule already. So there are quite a number of videos talking on different topics that you can see. So, um, cathode rays also are deflected towards the north side of the magnetic field and then they cause a downward motion in a magnetic field. Properties or characteristics of cathode rays are very, very common questions that students get asked in different examinations. So we have a few of them here. Cathode rays are negatively charged. We have talked about them, about those already. So they are attracted towards the anode because the anode is positively charged. They travel in straight lines. Ordinarily, cathode rays travel in straight lines. Deflections occur only when they are put in another field, say a magnetic field or an electric field. But ordinarily, they travel in straight lines. Cathode rays can ionize gas. They cause glass and other materials like zinc sulfide to flourish. Flourish, that means they shine, they shine brightly. They glow with a color, a green, green color. They can affect photographic plates and they have high penetrating power. They can penetrate steel, penetrate aluminum, penetrate gold, penetrate different metals like that. They are deflected towards a positive plate in an electric field and the north pole of a magnetic field, I talked about that earlier, they can produce X-rays from high density metals when they are suddenly stopped by such metals. So if you have a cathode ray, a beam of, uh, of cathode rays that are in motion and then they are suddenly stopped by high density metals, X-rays are produced from such metals. As I said earlier also, they are highly energetic. So they produce intense heat on objects which stop them. When they strike and everything, they are stopped. They have to um, come to a stop very suddenly. So there's a very, very high amount of heat dissipation. So intense heat is produced. They have mass, of course, meaning that they have energy. And hence, they have momentum. So in essence, we are saying that they are particles. They are not waves. Waves are not particles. Waves do not have, they are not treated as particles. You may have seen the video on um, energy quantization where I try to talk about the uh, wave particle duality and all that. Now, particles are different from waves. Particles have mass, but waves are not particles. They do not have a mass. Let's look at the applications of cathode rays. Cathode rays are used in fluorescent tubes. As I said earlier, they fluoresce. So they are using fluorescent tubes used for commercial displays and lighting. They contain vaporized mercury or sodium, which glow as the cathode rays pass through them. And they are more efficient than filament lamps. They are also using neon signs which are produced when an evacuated discharge tube is filled with neon gas and put under very low pressure. So the gas between, the gas discharge between the electrodes has a color which will depend on the nature of the gas in the tube and the nature of the coating inside the tube. That's a very important information. Neon, uh, neon signs. The, the color of gas discharge between electrodes in neon, neon signs is dependent on the nature of the gas in the tube and the nature of the coating inside the tube. Now let's look at something, still not the same topic, but slightly, I mean, not, not a property of cathode rays now. Let's look at thermionic emission. Thermionic emission. Thermionic, thermal, of course, you know thermal has to do with heat. That's where the word thermionic comes from. Thermionic emission is the emission of electrons from the surface of a hot metal. 
So when um, heat is made to uh, is made to strike the surface of a metal, and the metal gets hot enough, electrons are emitted from the surface of that metal. This is what we call thermionic emission. As I said earlier, also further explanation is on a video called energy quantization. You will learn a lot on th about thermionic emission in that video. It's right on this channel. Now, hot cathode is another way of producing free electrons. So apart from the discharge tubes where you can have cold cathodes, hot cathode is a way of producing free electrons, producing electrons through a process called thermionic emission. Now, one very uh, uh, common application of this is the cathode ray oscilloscope. This cathode ray oscilloscope called CRO is used for investigation of currents and voltages in electronic circuits. It's a vacuum tube also. It contains an electron gun at one end and a fluorescent screen at the other end. And between them, there are deflector plates somewhere in the middle of the tube. The instrument is used to study alternating current waveforms and to measure frequencies and amplitudes of voltages of electronic devices. So these are uses of the cathode ray oscilloscope to study alternating current waveforms and to measure frequencies and amplitudes of voltages of electronic devices. Here is a diagram of the cathode ray oscilloscope. The electron gun I talked about can, is visible right there. And we also have the fluorescent screen. That's different parts. Actually, we have the uh, accelerating anode. We have the, the cathode. This is a simple diagram of the cathode ray oscilloscope. Another very uh, important aspect of this topic that I should take note of is the similarities between thermionic emission and vaporization in liquids. Well, you know what vaporization is? Vaporization, that's when liquid changes to gas. Now, what's the similarity between that process and thermionic emission? Number one, heat is involved in both processes. Both have to do with heat. Both occur at the surface of a substance. Vaporization occurs at the surface. That's evaporation. It occurs at the surface. It is molecules at the surface of a liquid that get to escape. Under thermionic emission also, it is the surface of the metal that the electrons are released from. Now, the rate of occurrence of both increases with temperature. So if temperature of the metal increases, you will have more electrons being released from a metal, just as you have more liquid molecules converting to gas in vaporization. Of course, both release particles. The, in thermionic emission, the particle releases the electron. In a, a, a vaporization, a particle releases that the liquid molecules that become gas. Both can reach points of saturation, where the number of particles leaving the surface of a substance equals the number of particles returning. We talk about saturation point when the vapor molecule or the gaseous molecule of a particular substance is, is already saturated. The space is saturated so that it cannot accommodate new molecules. So let me explain this simply by saying that if you took a liquid, for instance, and you were boiling the liquid, at a point, the liquid begins to change to gas. Now, if that happens in an enclosed space, an enclosed container, the gas molecules being formed, they fill up the space on the top of the liquid. They fill up the space. It will get to a point where that space will no longer be able to hold any incoming gas molecules anymore. So, at that point, for any incoming gas molecules to be accepted, then the previous gas molecules, some of them must condense back to liquid. So that is the point where we call saturation. So both thermionic emission and vaporization in liquids can reach saturation. 
where the number of particles leaving the surface of, his, of the substance has to equal the number of particles returning. And of course, there are differences. Vaporization takes place from liquid surfaces of, uh, from surfaces of liquids, but thermionic emission takes place from surfaces of metals, metals, solid metals. Now, vaporization releases water molecules, of course, but thermionic emission releases electrons. Vaporization occurs at a particular temperature, that's maybe the boiling point, while thermionic emission may occur at any temperature, at any temperature at all. Thank you for being a part of this lesson. I believe that you have learned and will continue to learn um, from this video. You can always come back and play the video over and over again until you get all the information, all the facts and knowledge that you need. This is a homework that can help you to uh, see how far you have learned from the lesson. Explain how neon signs are produced. It's already in the notes of, of the slide. State two factors upon which the color of light from a fluorescent tube depends. I mentioned that also. State one difference between cathode rays and, and EM waves. List four properties of cathode rays. State two similarities and differences each between thermionic emission and liquid vaporization. All of this you will find if you go over this video again. Thank you again. Do not forget to subscribe, like, share, and drop a comment. Thank you.